how do I want to live my life? Um, how do I choose to earn money? And what do I want to do with that money? Um, when I earn it, do I want to buy the first edition Rolex or do I want to go on a bucket list um, holiday, have an experience? Uh, do I, and when should I do it? Let me do it now. Welcome to the Crossing It Off podcast, where we believe living with intention through a bucket list lifestyle is a great way to bring yourself personal joy. As you are crossing items off your list, you're actually filling up your bucket. The more items you cross off, the more joy gets added, until eventually your joy spills over into the lives of those around you. My name is Roger Williams, and as the host of this show, I will be interviewing guests, people just like you, that are crossing items off their own bucket list. My hope is that by hearing these stories, you will be inspired and empowered to cross items off your own bucket list when you find something impactful for your journey we invite you to share the episode with one other person and leave an honest rating or review of the show this is an amazing way for you to gift those feelings of inspiration and joy to others now let's start crossing it off together welcome everybody to another episode of the crossing off podcast so excited you're here with us today my guest, her name is Natasha Sharma, and she is an author, speaker, mentor, and she's a passionate person. Natasha, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having me. Yeah. So tell us, what did you cross off your bucket list? I have crossed off starting conversations about death and abundance. Okay. So where does this, it's a, it's a, it's a broad topic, but it's not, it happens to everybody. And I'm very curious about the adding of the abundance into the equation. But let's start about talking about, you know, before you decided that this is something you wanted to do, what was death like for you? Why was death something that attracted you to want to talk about? Because most people don't. Right. Absolutely. So I lost my mother when I was really young. And then after that, I've lost a lot of people who are very close to me to every type of death that you can possibly imagine from suicide to murder to terrorism to old age to terminal diseases and, you know, the whole gamut, basically. And um, I had to learn uh, firsthand how to cycle through the grieving process um, and all of that stuff. But what 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 made it come home to roost really was the pandemic. When people around us, around me, um, and globally, were just dropping like flies, regardless of like you know age or stage or any other you know circumstances, and that 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 made me feel that we really do need to be more open about this, and we need to be able to talk about death. We need to be able to talk about um, the grieving process openly um, and often, and that became a trigger point for me to accept my own death. And now that I've done that, I want to encourage people to do the same for themselves, which is why I like to come on shows like yours so that your listeners can benefit. Why is talking about it? How can that change your mindset or someone else's mindset? What change of your mindset did you did you find when you started talking about this more? What have you seen in other people? So above and beyond anything else, it's the charge. It's the emotional charge to the subject that reduces the more you talk about it. Um, and that that applies to anything, to any subject matter. But specifically, uh, if I talk about death, so my mission statement is to talk about death openly and often until it becomes a day-to-day dinner table conversation. The way that we can sit with our parents, our grandparents, our children, and discuss the next birthday party, we should be also be able to talk about death. Mm. So what was it that um, drew you to that? that take on this subject uh, I, f- I find it very interesting i recently you know this past year lost my father and I-, I had to deal with people saying oh i'm so sorry i'm so sorry and i'm like well i miss him right i watched a documentary about his favorite rock band last night and i i miss him you know and i was like oh i wish dad was here so we could talk about his take on this you know this perspective of the show but when people say I'm, I, I'm sorry for you, it's like I, I was lucky. He and I buried our stuff um, when I was 32. We we went through and we buried our stuff. I had 20 years where I was really able to have a really strong c- connection with him. He became one of my best friends, and 
and so I, I miss him, but I know how lucky I was in having that time. And so I don't, and I, and I know I'm luckier than a lot of other people who may not get 20 minutes um, of reconciliation with their parents. And so I, I try my best not to, you know, <laughs> glow over that fact, but at the same time, I want people to know, you know, no, I took, we took care of it. We were good. We were really good. So what was it that, triggered this in you to say okay this is why it's so important to have these conversations you know it's really funny but uh you touched upon a very uh, valid point here and it's a shared experience that you and i have had so um i'm sorry for your loss um and you know when people used to say sorry to me when my mother died i you know i was 16 i was like why are you apologizing to me what have you done you know it's not your <laughs> fault it took me a lifetime to realize that why people say sorry is basically they're projecting onto you uh, that whatever you might be feeling sad that they're sorry that you've had to go through that and they're there for you. I think that's how it started. But now it's just bas- it's basically words people say, right? But my dad was a narcissist, like a proper, proper, like um, fully charged narcissist. And obviously, you know, I've been a victim therefore, and it's been, we had a very, very difficult uh, relationship full of ups and downs and stuff like that. But um, one day, this is before I started honing on the conversations on death, but I started getting an awareness, like as I was on my self-awareness journey, and I was reconciling myself to all my other traumas, I also realized that, um, that my father and I had an ongoing story, And so I let go of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he and I, in the last year, we reached a stage where our relationship basically became neutral. It became devoid of any triggers and buttons. And we had this fresh relationship. And then he died a year later. So in fact, November's just started and end of this month is his one year death anniversary. And I, that was actually... Um, now that you mention it, that was actually one of my key turning points because I was very, very, very proud of myself that I had no regrets. Mm. Like I had to say bye to him. Fine. It was not an expected death. He wasn't, he wasn't even that old. He was only 77, shy of his 77th birthday. So, um, and he wasn't a long drawn out illness, not a lot of trauma or whatever. It's unexpected in a lot of ways. But I managed to cycle through the stages of grief really easily and I kept a check on it to make sure I wasn't in denial um and it really wasn't and I just felt free I felt happy for him and I was so proud of both of us that we had had a good relationship over the last you know year before he passed and so I get I get what you're saying and I get where you're coming from and this is what I I would love for everybody to have that same you know, perspective that live your life so that you don't have any regrets when they go or when you go, because that's going to happen. Yeah. How would you suggest people? I mean, it's not a subject that we talk about a lot in most times we're not expecting it. Um, Death to come. My situation is the same. My dad had brain cancer, He had four months and then he was gone, you know, once he was diagnosed. So, so it, it does come quickly. And, we, and we're usually not prepared for it, mostly because you're saying we don't talk about it enough. So what are some of the things people can do or that you help people do to talk about it more? What are, what are some of the suggestions you would make to help us deal with that a little bit better? So there are two parts to this. The first part is accepting your own death. The other part is accepting that your loved ones will die. So if we take the first part first, to start becoming responsible for your life and your things, because what happens is when you die, your loved ones have to go through the grieving process. They don't need to have to take care of all the bureaucracy. And there's a lot that goes into taking care of the arrangements and everything um, afterwards. And, you know, if you can just make it easier on them. So if we start with something really simple, like having a little notebook or a locked document on your desktop that has, you know, um, a to-do list so that people know what your wishes were. If they choose not to follow it, that's their call. But the point is that with, you know, obviously an ideal situation would be when you actually have a proper will and testament as well. But if you don't, then at least this, so they have some sort of guidance, right? 
um, a to-do list and all your passwords because today we're in the digital age. So we need to leave at least one person we trust with our passwords. So when, once you start doing that, then you will definitely get hit that, oh, with the reality of the fact that you're thinking about your death. And mm -hmm. then a lot of feelings will come up. And if it is a fear, then you figure a way to face your fears. And there's lots of ways, right? There are, you know, therapists that work with grief. There is um, the fact that you just need to cycle through. What does it mean? What are you scared about? It, you know, and how can you reach a reconciliation to that? Because this is a fact of life that you're alive so then you're going to die and the other thing is their loved ones so talking with your loved ones about their death finding out their last wishes isn't necessarily going to make losing them any easier but what it will do is take reduce the charge from the conversation like the devastation that you feel when you're not prepared to think that you're going to lose this person one day that gets lessened a lot in my experience and that is what is so important for us all to do here at the crossing off podcast we are passionate about inspiring you in your bucket list lifestyle and empowering you to live out your list we offer many resources to assist you in your bucket list journey such as web resources in the show notes bucket list mentoring services my book live out your lists a private facebook group for you to share your bucket list success stories with others and more all of these can be found at crossing it off podcast.com Find the resource that fits your need so that you can live out your list. Now back to the show. What if like you and I, we have kind of worked through that, that especially with our parents and we run into somebody that hasn't done this, who hasn't, you know, accepted it, who hasn't is still in denial or still in stages of grief what is our responsibility to those people? How do we communicate with them when we're not on the same page when it comes to death and abundance? Right. So there's a lot of, there's, there's quite a few of my friends, because obviously because of our age, our parents are at the aging stage, right? And, you know, when, when those parents fall sick and, you know, if my friends are telling me that, oh, I'm so worried, you know, they're sick. And I just look at them and I think that, you know, why? I mean, why is this surprising you? You know, they're, they're, they're aging. You know, they're growing old. But anyway, what I do end up talking to them about is that if you imagine the day that they die, do you have any regrets? Mm. And most of them will say, oh, that I didn't spend enough time with them. And I said, so then fix it. Spend time with them now. You know, it, you know, it, it might be it might sound a little harsh the way that I'm saying it. But the point is that these are really clear things that are signposted in black and white. And everyone knows this. This is almost like a cliche, but very few people act on it, which is the strange part, which is why I believe the more we talk about it, the more it will actually become real. Yeah, the denial is pretty heavy uh, in this kind mm -hmm. of stuff that people like don't want to imagine that person being gone. And, you know, it's like I said, I, I watched that rock and roll documentary about my dad's favorite band. And I'm just sitting there going, man, I just I wish I knew dad's take on it. I mean, I think I do, but I still would like I was, we we did that all the time. We, we you know, I, he'd find a documentary on rock and roll and share it with me or I'd find one and share it with him. And, um, you know, he's gone. I can't do that. And so there's sadness in that, but also know that we got to do that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, and so exactly. yeah so i'm just curious about how how are some of the ways that we can prep for other people uh the loss of other people close to us like what are some of the things we can do with them as far as talking about death i mean because some people just don't want to their own mortality don't want to deal with it yes exactly i mean so what you were saying about your uh, the rock and roll band documentary stuff, I had that kind of relationship with my grandmother, my mother's mother. So after I lost my mother, my, my grandmother sort of became uh, my bona fide mother. I, I, I used her to sometimes feel less sad about not having a mother. I'm like, I have my mother's mother. I have my grandmother, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we had a very, very close relationship. We, um, you know, I, I used to talk to her about boys and sex, like much easier than I could talk to my aunts and uncles. Mm -hmm. um, she was one really, really um, amazing lady. I lost her four years ago. Um, and we used to have conversations about everything, including death. But interestingly, there used to be always a stage beyond which she wouldn't go in a conversation. 
about death. And I actually thought that we covered everything. However, to my shock and horror, I realized that I never actually asked her. So she had her will and all in place. Everything was fine. We knew what she, you know, what her wishes were. But nobody had ever asked her and neither had she conveyed what she wanted done with her ashes. Mm. You know, so things, you know, and that was a huge piece. There was so much fighting and so much disagreement. I mean, I don't want to get into the details, but I was like, why didn't I ever ask her? Why did that never come up in conversation? Well, and again, I think it's us talking about our own mortality, too, and seeing that as a way to not burden others when we're gone that's Mm -hmm. what you're saying is that there was almost this burden placed upon you all to figure out where the ashes should go instead of uh you know saying this is what i want i have let my (laughs) my my people close to me know what i want um so uh, so i think i've done a good job natasha you you talked in the beginning about death and abundance what how does the abundance piece show up in what you're talking about so (laughs) When I sat and I re uh, and I went through the whole accepting my own death and I reprioritized things and I prioritized experiences over material things, when I sit in that present moment, I feel so wealthy. I feel so expanded, and I really feel that I have all the abundance coming my way. To me, wealth is not necessarily, or the word abundance and wealth isn't necessarily dollars and cents. Mm. It is how I feel about life. Am I happy? And do I have any regrets? Am I joyful? And I found accepting death has brought me that kind of abundance. It's brought me that kind of joy of living where Egypt can just appear on my plate. And um, so that's what I mean by the uh, by the by the abundance. But it also does work with the dollars and cents because once you're reprioritizing, then that is also monetary as well. What do you think is the number one benefit that people can get out of um, actively talking about death and the abundance that you can find through it? So I'll talk about my own experience when I. So what happened to me during the pandemic is that I looked at myself in the mirror one day. And I look deep into my eyes and I'm like, okay, you can die any minute now. There's this whole pandemic happening. And I actually was like, oh, and I, you know, sort of had all this like stuff happening around my heart area, a lot of like sort of panic. I started, I cried as well. And then I I, I forced myself to continue looking at myself. And then I guess, you know, the stages of grief went passed through me and I and I really sat with this for for a couple of uh, a couple of days and once I came through the other side I realized that my choices that I had now ahead of me that how do I want to live my life um how do I choose to earn money and what do I want to do with that money um when I earn it do I want to buy the first edition Rolex or do I want to go on a bucket list um holiday have an experience uh, do I and sh- when should I do it let me do it now you know my life became so much freer um from the whole advertising aspirational materialistic get 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 go 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 keep up with the Joneses it really really fell away for me and uh, that's what I believe that talking about this will help people to realize that hey I do have a choice I don't need to have that holiday home if I'm not going to, you know, I have to leave that to somebody. If I am not going to be (laughs) using it to the maximum capacity, then why am I buying this holiday home to leave it? You know, if you don't have kids, I'm leaving it to X, Y, Z, niece or nephew or, you know. So you really sit and think about the material aspects and really realize you ain't taking anything with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're just leaving a bunch of crap for the people you're leaving behind. <laughs> I think that that's uh, that is true, uh, Natasha. This has been a great conversation. Speaking of bucket list, what is the next thing on your list that you want to cross off? 
Ooh, you know, I really believe that you've brought this into my life after <laughs> I uh, signed up for your podcast. Um, I actually had um a thing that I didn't know was on my bucket list, an opportunity actually come up. So I've been obsessed with Egypt, and of course, Egypt is uh, you know the the Sphinx and the and the pyramids has been so much a part of like stuff we've learned in school, and you know all the gods and goddesses, and of course now that I'm all about life and death. Then you know the Egyptians did. They, they <laughs> did it. The best, right? Yeah, just about. <laughs> yeah, if you were a pharaoh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I have been invited to be part of a collaborative book in uh, 2023 in September. It's a two week trip uh, where we're going to be visiting all these temples, 25 writers traveling together, having writing workshops, just jamming with our writing, and at the end of it, we'll come out with a book and. Just the thought we're going to be cruising on the Nile for a whole week. Wow. And I didn't even realize this was my bucket list. But when I started reading the itinerary, it was like my dream came true. I was just like, what? So, yes, I actually have <laughs> something very concrete. And that book will be out in January of 2024. Nice. Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer that it's not about the list. The list is a catalyst to get you thinking about life in different ways. And I've had those experiences too, where something comes up and I'm like, I didn't have this on my list, but should I put it on it and then cross it off or what, you know, and it's just, it's just about living life and, and being open to experiences. So uh, I hope that's where everybody gets through this journey with us. Um, Natasha, I, I'm excited you were here with us today. Where can people find more information about your book and and the work that you do? So I don't have, um, stuff happening right now except for except for my writing so if people follow me on instagram that's really the best way i'm not super socially active social media active but what it does is uh i will be updating my activities so um things that i'll become i'm, I'm really sure that a lot of stuff is going to happen in 2023 of course my books will be releasing and i'm sure there'll be a lot of other activities so if you follow me on instagram um and uh, just sign up to my website then you know uh, you'll be posted and you can keep in touch and that would be fantastic Awesome. Well, I hope we see lots of pictures on your Instagram account from your uh, trip to Egypt. That would be great. Uh, thank yes. you so much for being here, Natasha, and uh, good luck to you with everything else you have going on. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Hey.